Thank you so much. Use this. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. It's a very, it's a great honor to be here. This is my first time in Central Asia, so I'm glad it was Kyrgyzstan as my starting point. And I love the fact that we're meeting in a giant yurt-like building. It's amazing. This is a, f a phenomenal building. Um, but it's, it is great to be here, uh, and I know it's been a very long day for everybody, so if you feel the need to stand up and, like, move around, that's fine. I won't be offended. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is to build on all the great talks that we've already heard, because I know for a lot of you as developers, you want your game to be made, you want to make money off it, you want to build a business. The other part of it, though, is what kind of game are you making? and will it be successful in other parts of the world? Now, I've spent 30 years, 3-0, 30 years in the game industry. This is my 30th year in games. I've worked on many, many games. I was at Microsoft for 13 years. I've worked on Call of Duty, Halo, Age of Empires, Civilization, Apex Legends, FIFA, Madden Football. I could go on and on. In my 30 years, I've worked on 267 games in all that time. And so, thank you. Um, now, my background is I'm a geographer, so I study culture, I study politics and geopolitics and cartography, map making. That's what I do for a living. But I've also worked in games and I help game developers navigate the very difficult uh, content issues around releasing your game into different markets and it, because it's not easy. So if I um, take a look and we think about different games that are out there, games like Tears of the Kingdom or Skyrim, these games are very big, complex role-playing games that take many years to develop. There's a ridiculous amount of content in them. And you can imagine all the things in this world, everything they have to think about to build this fictional world. And there's so many places where a game could go potentially wrong in a, in a specific market because of something that might be in this world. Um, or we can talk about things like Halo. I worked on all the original Halo games way back when at Microsoft. Um, even though this takes place in our universe, it's our reality, but in the far future. Um, or games like Assassin's Creed, where they've done a very creative mix of real history, real geography, but then they have a fictional narrative on top of the real history and geography. And when you're dealing with real history and geography, as you will hear later, it gets very, very complicated. Um, even things like Angry Birds, we have to remember, a lot of people see this and they say, well, that's just a simple game. There's nothing simple about making a mobile game, as you know. Um, when you create a world like this, there's still a lot of assumptions you make about what happens in this world. And there's a narrative here about birds versus pigs. Now, maybe that narrative was not fully explored in this game, but they explored it on TV, in movies, in comic books, in other forms of media. Um, to make that world basically more real for people who love that universe. So I have spent the last 30 years exploring this whole interaction between what is real, that's the geography out there, behind, you know, outside the building, and then what is represented, which is, which is how we put, build things in our games, and then how it's perceived. So how do people perceive the worlds that we build as game developers? And this is, uh, this is a really complicated interaction. Now, that scene behind there, you may recognize it as Los Angeles, California, where I'm from originally, but it's actually, that's Los Santos from Grand Theft Auto V. And they did an amazing job of replicating Los Angeles. Um, so my job, basically, for the last 30 years is to take the game worlds that game developers create and see how are those game worlds going to be compatible with local worldviews. And so we do an exercise which I call culturalization, where we culturalize the content to see and make sure that all the content assets in those worlds that are being built are going to be compatible with the local culture, which includes local political issues, geopolitical issues, local laws, and all kinds of other things. And you will see examples, don't worry. Um, and so there's this zone of, of, of compatibility or incompatibility where I'm looking at the content assets across the entire game, the characters, the, the buildings, the ships, everything you can imagine I have to look at and help the developer navigate whether or not it might be a problem. So most of you, I think you all understand what localization is. In the game industry, localization is language translation, so offering your game 
in a translated version. Now, that's always been important. That's been important for software for many decades, um, and it's been important for games, too. But culturalization is different. So localization is done for text legibility, but culturalization is done at a deeper level. It's not just about the language. It's about the entire design, and it's about the world that you're building. Is the world going to translate as a concept in other cultures? Are people going to understand the story? That's what I'm talking about with culturalization. So it's not just language. Um, and so at its core, what culturalization really is, is about is about making your game globally inclusive, to, to try and have as many people around the world enjoy your game and, and just really just enjoy the creative vision that you made. Um, that's one of the beauties of a game of like Angry Birds. It's so simple and the design is so clear. It's one of the reasons it became this huge international phenomenon because there wasn't really anything there to cause a problem in different markets. It's like it was pretty universal that people loved the game. Plus, it was very easy to play. That was also very helpful. Um, Another difference between culturalization and localization is that usually when you're going to localize text in your game, you have to wait until the game is almost finished. But with culturalization, we look at things early. So we have to, I sit down, for example, like right now I'm working on Dragon Age 4. I sit down with the designers, with the writers, and we talk about what is the world you're building, who is in it, what's the narrative, what happens, to, what does the player do in this world. So we talk about all these concepts very, very early because at the early stage it's really easy to find things that might be a potential problem when they finally you know start developing the game so culturalization tends to happen early and localization tends to happen later because it, the text in the game has to be finished so then the translators can do their job um, now why is this important why why do we care about making sure our game goes to other markets. Well, you just heard a bunch of lectures about how it's important about generating revenue in different markets. But from a content perspective, what we're trying to think about is when I visit a lot of emerging markets, places like Kyrgyzstan, what I hear from a lot of developers is that they want their games to sell in the West. They want their games to sell in North America, in Western Europe, because a lot of people feel that's where all the money is. That's where I can, you know, my game will be famous there. There's a certain amount of truth to the exposure that you can have in the West, but the reality is, if you look at a chart like this, the growth is not happening in North America. It's not happening in, in Western Europe. The real growth is happening in areas that a lot of game developers don't think about as a target market for their game. The Middle East and North Africa, Latin America, Asia Pacific region. I mean, this, these are you know, markets which I think because of where you're located, you understand this. But a lot of places around the world, uh, the developers keep saying, well, I'm going to focus on, I want my game to sell in the United States. The United States is completely oversaturated with games. But so you, one of the things I encourage you to do is think about other markets. How can your game be appealing from a content perspective to other markets around the world? So um, there's two types of culturalization that we typically deal with. So one is what I call reactive culturalization. So that's where we look at things in the game that might be a problem that stops the game from being sold in that market. So this is from Fallout 3. If you remember that game, I worked on Fallout 3 years ago. This object here is the whole reason that the game did not sell in India. Why? Because it's a Brahmin bull. It's a mutated, two-headed Brahmin bull. And if you know, in, in India, in the Hindu faith, Brahmin bulls are sacred. And there's even laws in India that protect real Brahmin bulls from being harmed. And so there was fear that those laws might apply to this mutated virtual version of the bull. And so this is the whole reason why the game did not sell in India, for this one object. Now, what they could have done is take my poorly photoshopped two-headed horse. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So this poorly photoshopped two-headed horse, this would have worked fine in India. This would have been no problem. But the developer did not want to make the change because it was very late in the development cycle. So unfortunately, the game never released in India. Um, the other part is that we can do what we call proactive culturization, where we look for ways to enhance our game for a specific market. So for example, I've worked on the game Temple Run, uh, which you've probably heard of, the mobile game. And what we did on Temple Run, we, f we were going to do an experiment to make the game very specifically culturalized for Mexico. 
to celebrate the Day of the Dead holiday, the Dia de los Muertos holiday in Mexico. So we changed the game. We put in artwork that, that celebrates that specific holiday in Mexico. When we released the game for that holiday, the sales went crazy through the roof because we culturalized it very specifically for that market. It was so successful that we did another version for the Holy Holiday, the Festival of Colors in India, and the game likewise saw this huge spike in sales because they saw that the company was willing to do something that's very culturally specific to a, a single market, which for, in some cases that, might be a, that could be a really good idea. Um, now, when we make, when we do culturalization, we have to think about many different things. It's not just simply looking at an object and saying yes or no. Um, we have to think about what are your values as a creator? What are you willing to change? Like, for example, if a government says, we don't like this character design, we're not, re we're not going to allow your game to release, are you going to change it or are you going to keep it the way it is? That's something that you have to decide, and that decision is based on your values and what you are willing to stand for. The other thing is the context in which content is generated. What I'm basically saying here is that all of us are biased because we come from a specific language, geography, and culture. Now, most all of us, we, over, we try and overcome our bias with education. That's why we go to school for so long. But sometimes in the creative process, that bias will show through. I've seen a lot of stereotypes, for example, cultural stereotypes, ethnic stereotypes being used in games because the developer just, they didn't know any better. Um, also, the business strategy for the specific vertical. So if you're Sony and Microsoft, you have to think about the fact that you don't make only games. Games are only one of your businesses. You make a lot of other things, a lot of other kinds of software and hardware. So this decision that you're making might actually affect your other businesses. Um, you also have to think about the uh, strategy for the specific locale because selling a game in China is very different from selling a game in Saudi Arabia or selling a game in Brazil. You also think about the market strategy for the specific genre, um, like what we heard just before me, that the genre type is ch it's radically different how markets receive different genres. So if it's a role-playing game, your strategy for a role-playing game is going to be very different from some other kind of game like a first-person shooter. And then finally, the changing geopolitical, cultural, and, and other social factors, because if there's one thing the last few years have taught us, is that this world is a very, very dynamic place. Things change very quickly. And so I don't need to mention this. We all know what this is. But I, the reason I mention this example is because immediately after this, what happened is that so many companies in the game industry, they did not know what to do. They had to make decisions about what, how to handle content in their games that involved Russia and Ukraine. So for that whole month after that happened last year, I had to work with my clients because nobody, they didn't know what to do. They're like, do we take the content out? Do we just do nothing? I mean, where do we, where do we stand on this as a company? And this kind of impacted them having to think about where, where do we stand on this issue? Do we take a stand? So it's a very complicated thing to see how real world events, geopolitical events, cultural events will affect games and they will affect the perception of your game. So it's something you have to think about. Um, so a lot of times I get, the, I get question from people, why the hell is a geographer working in the game industry? Um, it's a good question. Um, one of the reasons because geographers, the job that they do is they spend all of their time, this is what we do, is we basically deconstruct the real world. So, and we reconstruct it in the form of a map. So any map you have ever seen is what I would call a world rebuilding exercise. Just like games are world building, maps are world rebuilding. And the way that we do that is we think about the world out there and we think about everything in, this, in the natural environment as a, as a layer of information. And we organize that information in a geographic information system, which is our digital way of making maps today. And so we think about what layers do we need to make the map when we want to reconstruct the world. In the very same way, when you're creating a game and you're creating a world, you're doing the exact same thing. What do we need in this world in order to basically serve the narrative purpose and the experience that we want to serve to the player? So you have to think about what different elements go into the environment. What do we need to put into our world? 
So what I want to talk about briefly are some of the most challenging things, the challenging themes that have affected a lot of games that I've worked on. And um, I will just list them right here, but I will, I will oops. Uh, oh, OK, that was interesting. Anyway, I will list them here, and I will describe them in detail. So the first is history. Using, if you make a game that involves real history, <clears throat> like the Assassin's Creed series, or Age of Empires, or Civilization, or any game like that, it's very, very complicated. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So for example, this was from the first Age of Empires game in this, oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, thank you. Um, so in the very first Age of Empires, we had a scenario where Japan in blue was invading Korea. This really happened. The, the history books tell us that this is what happened. So Japan invades Korea, and they almost take over the Chosun Empire. This is back in the Middle Ages. So the developers said that's a great scenario to add into the game. So they put it in the game, and then the game was released in Korea, in South Korea. And the day it was released, the game was banned by the Korean government. Why? Well, the reason is the Korean government says that this never happened. They say this is not their version of history. And so we had to decide as a company, this is a time when Microsoft was growing its games business. It was pre-Xbox. Xbox was in the background still. We were growing our games business. We also knew from market research that South Korea is a very, very important gaming market. There's a huge gaming uh, you know, community in, in South Korea. And we also knew that real-time strategy games like Age of Empires are also extremely popular in Korea. So the decision we made, a business decision, is that we have to release this in Korea. And what did we do to, because the game was banned, so how did we fix it? We actually changed history in order to release in Korea. So now, instead of the Japanese invading Korea, the Koreans are invading Japan. This did not happen. This is fiction. But you have to think about, so you can imagine that on the development team, this created a big debate about truth and ethics. Is this the right thing to do? But a lot of people saw it as a business decision. They said, we have no choice. If we want the game to release, we either take this out completely, which was very difficult to do, or we change history for the sake of the Korean government. So we chose to change history. Um, now there's precedent for that in a lot of other games. There's precedent in other, in even other decisions we made at Microsoft. But it was not, it, it had its own level of controversy among the development team. Some people felt this was not the right thing to do. But it's what they ended up doing in the end. Um, faith, of course, when we're releasing games into cultures where they have a strong faith, their culture is based on uh, religious beliefs, we have to be very careful. So like in this game, Hitman 2, what they did is they took the main action of the game into the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India, which is the center of the Sikh faith. And so they had the main character not only in the most sacred place of the Sikhs, they had him killing Sikhs inside the sacred place. And so this, of course, was very controversial. And so this was a problem which was identified. You know, it's like, that's a big mistake. You don't put the action of your game inside a real world sacred place. Um, just like this game, this is a fictional world from the game Cameo. And what they did is they used wooden crosses as a grave marker. And what was interesting about this is that the, the artists just assumed that everybody would know that a cross is a grave marker. But obviously, even here on, on our planet, there are many, many, many types of grave markers because there's many different faiths. And so it was kind of naive to assume that a cross would be the appropriate grave marker that everybody's going to understand, especially, especially when this is a fictional universe where Christianity does not even exist. So it makes no sense to have the cross in that environment. Um, things like human representation are very important today. On social media, you will hear arguments about this all the time. So like, here's an example from Resident Evil 5, where we see this white male Caucasian here, he's shooting these black people in Africa. Now, the developer, and you can see that the developer started getting a lot of pushback and a lot of angry people on the internet because of this imagery. Now, the thing is, though, the developer, they kind of shrugged and said, well, we don't understand because the African people are zombies, as you can see in that other image, so he has to shoot them. 
But here's the issue. Remember, I mentioned about the context in which content is generated. This game is developed in Japan. Japan is 98% ethnic Japanese. So they don't have the same context for understanding the racial tension that they are portraying here because this image was explosive in the United States. Very explosive in the United States. But in Japan, they don't have the same level of understanding because that's just not the, the world they live in. Now, that doesn't excuse them. They still should have done their research before they did this. And they did make changes to the game based on that, that feedback they were getting. Um, but this, you know, this is just a good example where our bias can sometimes, you know, make us blind to the issues that we're putting in our game. Human representation, this is kind of an obvious one. Um, we made this version, um, this is a game I worked on, where the versions on the right are the versions that we made for the, middle, the, ver the game when it was released in the Middle East. Because you cannot show the versions on the left uh, in the Middle East. And so we made those versions, and frankly, I think the versions on the right look amazing. They look like they're actually ready to fight. The ones on the left are not. <laughs> That's not the way you go into battle. Um, and so, unfortunately, though, the, the developer felt that they were not going to offer the ones on the right to players in the West. Because they said, well, Western players don't want to see that. And it's like, well, you know that almost half of players today are women, so you, you're basically excluding an entire huge amount of money from your game because women may not want to play the versions on the left, and you're not offering any other option. Um, Geopolitical issues, very, very tricky to deal with. So like here's, this is from the game Ninja Gaiden that I worked on. And you can see here, you see the line where it says country select, and it has the flag of Taiwan, and it says ROC, which means Republic of China. That's the name, the alternative name for Taiwan that will get you instantly banned in China. And as well as showing the Taiwan flag will get you instantly banned in China. So how do we fix this? Well, let me just tell you that if you're showing ROC, plus it says country, you're making a very strong political statement. You're saying that the Republic of China is a country. So you're walking on very, very thin ice on this issue. But it will get you instantly banned in China. So how do you fix it? It's actually pretty simple. The first thing you do is you take the flag out because you don't need it. It's redundant information. The second thing is you say Taiwan because that name is acceptable to both China and Taiwan. And you put country slash region. So now, is Taiwan a country or is it a region? That's not for you to assert as a developer. That's for the user to perceive on their side. So now you don't have to worry about it. So is it going to, you know, that's basically the user can decide you know where they sit on that particular political issue um, this things like this too you may have heard about this issue with top gun um, this has made a huge impact on both film and games because um, in the original film top gun tom cruise wore this jacket which had the J japanese flag and the taiwan flag on the back and so then when the the new film top gun maverick when they showed the trailer that came out a long time ago, before COVID, the trailer was showing this jacket without the Japanese flag and without the Taiwan flag, but it's supposed to be the same jacket from the same, you know, exact same jacket. So a lot of people on the internet were really, really pissed off. They were wondering where, where did the Japanese flag go? Where did the Taiwan flag go? Now, because the film was delayed for so long because of COVID, what the, the backlash was so severe on the internet that the filmmakers actually went in and they changed it to back to make it look like the original jacket. And so they said when the film released in Taiwan, the theaters were erupting with cheers because their flag was appearing on the jacket. And so this also meant that the film never released in China. But what, the, what it showed though is they, so here's a company, they stuck to their values. They said that we're not going to make this change and we're going to sacrifice the Chinese market, but the film still made almost two billion US dollars. So it did perfectly fine without China. So it's actually showing a lot of companies that maybe you, you don't have to do whatever it takes to go to China because you will have to make a lot of changes to your content if you want to sell in that market. 
Um, and we deal with this outside of games all the time. I was consulting for Google um, for over six years to help them perfect what we call domain tailoring. So when you go to Google Maps, you will see different versions of the map depending on where you are in the world because there's different requirements. So like the northern area of Kashmir is a disputed area, but in India, you have to show it as Indian territory or else your game will be instantly banned if you're not showing it correctly. Oops, sorry. Um, intercultural tension. This is another interesting category. So this is all kinds of issues where two or more countries may not like each other or different cultures may not, may not like each other or there's issues that are, don't translate well between cultures. So for example, right here we've got, this is from the games Dance Central that I worked on. So you see the character on the left, he's doing this gesture, which when you see it in motion, it almost looks like he's doing this. So if you know what that gesture is, that's the same as the middle finger. Um, and so that's a little bit sensitive to have somebody doing that during a dance game. And what she's doing over there, which most of us see is rock on, so we know that it's the rock and roll gesture, but uh, in Italy it means I'm sleeping with your wife. It's called the cornetto. So gestures are very culturally specific. So for example, Facebook uses the thumbs up gesture, but in, a lot, in several countries, the thumbs up is the same as the middle finger. So um, yeah, it's very sensitive. So that's part of intercultural tension. Um, the other part of intercultural tension, which gets a lot of attention today, is cultural appropriation. We, we see this on social media all the time. A lot of game developers will use elements for their designs that are taken from indigenous cultures from around the world. Native Americans, Maori, and other, you know, other kind of indigenous cultures. And so there's a lot of backlash over these issues. So you have to be very, very careful about what designs you put in your game. So here's just several examples from games that I've worked on where they were using things like the Maori tattoos that are used over here are completely, these people are not Maori. They're not supposed to be wearing those tattoos. Just like this character here from Apex Legends, she's from South Asia, but she's wearing Native American designs. And so people from those <laughs> indigenous cultures really do not appreciate seeing their designs being used by somebody else. So the last few points I want to talk about is the first thing is that we have to remember that all content carries culture. It carries the culture of your team. It t basically tells people who you are as a developer, and it carries the culture of your country with it. So if you release content out into the world and say, this is, you know, here's our amazing game, but if you put something in there that could be potentially problematic, then a lot of people are going to judge you based on that decision that you made. They're not even going to look at the quality of the game. They're going to see that one issue that they feel you made a mistake about and now they're going to look they're basically going to <clears throat> look very negatively at, at, at your game um, and so we have to think about the creative decisions that you make have to be tied to your values as a creator what who do, who are you who do you what do you stand for um, you know what do you want to be known for as a creator it, and it's a constant struggle because we're constantly dealing between the the values that we have as creators where we stand on social issues political issues and our business goals which is making money which is very important and also our creative goals having creative integrity and not wanting to change our creative vision because you know we came up with this game idea and we don't really want to change it so we, we it's a constant struggle between these different things um, the values you have define essentially how you want the world to perceive you and your work um, and then the policies that you create inside your development team define how your values will influence your creative process. So for example, if you say that we believe in inclusivity is one of our values, well then you have to show that. It has to show through in your game development. Do you have all a bunch of white characters or you do have, you know, what do, what do the characters look like in your game? How, do, how does inclusivity as a value get represented in your work? And the reason I bring this up is because there's so much scrutiny today on game development and any kind of creative content, not just games, films, television, everything. Social media is just waiting. They're just waiting to attack you for something. And you have to be thinking about are we just going to like forget about it and say we don't care what they say, which you, is an option, or you might want to think about are we willing to sacrifice that market because we're not going to change something, or do we want to gain that market and make a few small changes? Um, 
So we have these challenges today in the, in the release environment where everything we release is instantly out there in the world to a multi global multicultural audience. And we have a massive community of people on different forms of social media who are just waiting to either support you for your work and support you for your creative vision or attack you and try and drag you down or cancel you or whatever else. Um, but the other part of it too is this, this mind share issue where different governments and other institutions are basically fighting over who gets to control the cultural narrative, which is part of what your game is about because your game carries culture, whether you know it or not. And I'm not saying even if your, your game doesn't have to be explicitly about a cultural issue, it's just the fact of the different uh, elements you put in your game, how your game is presented can represent your culture. Um, so you just have to be thinking on another level when you're developing your game about how do you want you how do you want people out there in the world to perceive your creative work, um, and so the final thing I'm going to mention is is the is the importance of the freedom of creativity because I'm a very strong believer that games are an artistic art they're artistic form of self-expression they're just as valid as painting or literature or music or film or television, we are at the same creative level. So we have the ability to make games about anything you can imagine, good and bad, but you just have to remember that if, you're, if that's your creative vision, it's not going to work everywhere. That's just the simple reality of the world we live in. So you have to think about what are you willing to change or not change. So we're constantly dealing with these two extremes. One is what I call maximize expression, which means self-expression, artistic self-expression. So this is like pure creative freedom. This is where a lot of indie developers live. They live over on this side because you're basically making the game you want to make. You're not really doing any changes to it. You're making your pure creative vision. But on the, the other side is maximizing exposure. So what do you do to get your game to as many places as possible in the world? Usually, what, the, what I call the default version, which is like the pure creative vision with no changes, that version is not going to work everywhere. It just usually doesn't. It's very rare today that that pure piece of art that you created as a game is going to work everywhere. So that's why companies start doing modifications. They do localization and culturalization, which I talked about. And the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more you localize and culturalize, the more you are maximizing the exposure of your game. Because if you translate the game more, if you do more culturalization, that allows your game to maximize its reach around the world. And um, the main important thing here is that none, neither of these are the right answer. The right answer is what you decide for yourself and for your team. But these are often the extremes we deal with. So oftentimes we have indie developers are over here working on their pure artistic game and big AAA developers, console developers, EA, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, they're all over here because they're, they play it safe. They make games that tend to be more safe in terms of their themes um, because they can't afford to lose all that money because they've got these massive game creation machines with thousands of people working for them. And that's why you see Call of Duty 25 and Halo 15 and all these franchises because they have to play it safe. Whereas indie developers, like many of yourselves, have that freedom to do things that games have not done before. And that's why I think it's great because you're breaking new ground and coming up with new ideas, uh, but you still have to be careful about how the world is going to perceive your idea. So, um, so that is essentially my talk. And um, yes, I don't know if we have room for questions or not.